Welcome to a Fast Tracks Live episode here on a Friday evening. Hopefully you're joining me somewhere around the country and you are getting ready for a wonderful weekend. Well, we're also getting ready for a little exam prep, so we're going to do a little bit of that tonight. Um, and uh, hopefully you got your code books handy, spur of the moment, get you in the mood. Hopefully you are preparing for an exam, maybe the first of next week or maybe the next couple weeks. So uh, we're going we're gonna to get you in the mood for it tonight. All right, so we're going to be working on some journeyman questions tonight. But again, don't let that discourage you. If you happen to be a master electrician uh, or you're getting ready to be a master electrician, don't look, code's code. So we don't worry about all that. We just kind of work on the questions and uh, kind of see where it may lead us in tonight's episode. So Ken, let's go on and get started uh, into tonight's lesson. All right. And so here we got. So again... I want to welcome folks that join us in the stream, Mr. Puffing Ass. I love the name. Uh, Poo Cat Killer. Okay, welcome. Okay, take your journeyman's test tomorrow. Well, here you go. This is gonna be great for you. If you're taking your test tomorrow. All right, so let's look at what we got on the screen. And by the way, I will mention at the top of the screen, you will see we have our special 50% off over on FastTracksTube.com. That's where you're going to be able to see videos like this exclusively uh once they broadcast that is where they're going to be so if you're interested in that check out that that's an amazing special that we got going on right there okay so let's look at it first so we're looking at a question it says a 24 inch conduit nipple is permitted to be filled to blank percentage of the total cross-sectional area okay so you got your national electrical code you're thinking okay where do i need to go to figure out this and What's my percentage and what's the amount that I can fill it to, right? All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to go over to the NEC and see where you might find this. But again, you can do a little deductive reasoning here uh, if you are been studying the code long enough to just kind of look at something here. Uh, obviously, it's you're able to fill it. Now, what percentage? It's a nipple. So obviously, you're not going to be able to fill it 100%. That makes no sense. Y'all probably familiar with 40%, which is over two. You're probably familiar with two conductors, which is 53. So that really only leaves you one choice remaining. So again, this is an example of where you can use the knowledge that you've built up, right? So you've been studying, you've been cracking the code book open, you've been doing a lot of work. And this is an example of this question is something you would answer in the first wave and just get on by it. But we're gonna go look at it in the code. So I'm gonna go get our code book here and see if we can't get us here. Okay, so bear with me with the code or the code, there it is over here. Uh, and we'll try to go where we need to go on this one. So what we're gonna be looking at, obviously we're gonna be in where? Chapter nine, table one, that's the table that has all the fill requirements. So again, tonight we're gonna be focused on things you need to remember. Think about raceway fill. Think about chapter nine, think about table one, okay? All right, so let's go on and get down, let me go on and get down to it. So we'll go down to chapter nine, and let's see here, and we'll get down to, here's table one, okay? So you see that on the screen, you might be able to see it, it might be too small to, to see, but again, you should have your code book, right? If you don't have your code book, I'm not gonna zoom in to make it easier for you. Um, just is what it is. So here you go. So here is your typical ones that we're familiar with, right? 53%. Okay, that's for one. I don't know why I said two. That's for one. Uh, 31 is for two. And then over two is 40. You're all familiar with that. And you come down here to these notes, though. Here's note four. And note four 
says we're a conduit or tubing nipples, not including connectors. Okay, so not including the connector, having a maximum length not to exceed 24 inches. Okay, so you're talking about the conduit and tubing. That's what we're talking about. Okay, not the connector part. Okay are installed between boxes, cabinets, and similar enclosures. The nipple shall be permitted to be filled to 60% of the total cross-sectional area, okay? All right, so, and then it says, and 31015C1 adjustment factors need not apply. Y'all know that that 31015C1, or at least you should know, that 31015C1 has to do with trying to do an adjustment for the number of current carrying conductors that are in there. We don't have to worry about that for that small little nipple, right? Okay, so that's where it is in the code. Again, so it's hard for you to see. It's in your code book and it is under uh, chapter nine, table one, all the way down note number four, okay? So one of the things I tell students is if you can highlight in your code book, you can highlight these so they stand out but then come down to note four and make sure you highlight the 60 percent that type so the kind of percentages will kind of stick out to you a little bit right so that type of thing so any rate all right so that's where we're, we've got for that so let's go on and get back to the question so we obviously if in our case we're going to choose 60 and here's our references there you go Chapter nine, table one, note number four. Sweet, great. Um, again, we could have used deductive reasoning on this. If you're studying properly, you know that it couldn't be 100, so now you didn't increase your odds of getting it right because you got rid of the 100. And of course, you knew 53 is one conductor, 40 is over two. You didn't see an option for anything else, right? 33, that, that's not here. So what do you got? 60 it can be the only option, okay? So that is basically a little deductive reasoning. So we didn't have 31, wasn't available for us. I don't know why I keep saying 33. Anyway, there you go. All right, next question, folks. The minimum radius used uh, using a one-shot bender, okay? A normal shoe, normal bender, bend field type of bender. For a one inch EMT or trade size one, we should say, is, all right, so where would you go look for this? So this is one of those ones where you gotta say, okay, wait a minute. Since you're asking me about minimum bending radiuses, I'm not going to go look at any of the wiring methods you know, areas, because again, this is talking about a one, sh one shot bender, okay? So you're sitting there going, okay, where do I go? Well, we were just there chapter nine, but in this case, we're gonna be looking at table two. So the, the reason I'm doing this way and not use, letting you use the index here is because these are certain things I want you to remember. If they ask you something about minimum radius and it has something to do with a bender, you know the NEC doesn't really care about the bender, right? Right, so that should be a low hanging fruit. Let me turn my phone off here. Everybody always wants to text me when I'm doing something. Um, and so this is like low hanging fruit for you to remember. Okay, if it's asking me about a one shoe, a one shot, uh, all this type of, then I'm gonna go to chapter nine and I'm gonna go to table two, all right? So let's do that real quick. So we're already here. So let's see if we can't go down the radius of the bins. And of course you see here, it says radius, right? And then you've got this table and you see it says one shot, or full shoe bender, right? So again, you got your values that are gonna be in this column and we're asking for it in inches, not millimeters. So the value that we're looking for in the question, right, that we had was, and let's see if I can get the question, it is trade size one, okay? So it'd be right here. So let's just follow this across. We'll just highlight that so we can see it. We can see one, so here's the one. And it looks like it's five and three quarter. Okay. Makes sense. All right. So we're going to go back to our tab. And it looks like it's obviously at this point, it's going to be five and three quarter. So right here. And here's our code reference. NEC reference 
chapter nine, table two. So commit this type of thing to memory when you think about it, just kind of think, all right, this question was asking me about a bender. There's nothing in the code. It didn't ask me about the maintained bending radius of uh, a cable or something like that. It was asking me about a bender. So think of chapter nine, table two. If you get any of those questions, it kind of hammers something like that on you. Just make sure you, you pay attention and you be prepared for something like that. Okay. All right. Let's go to the next one. Great job, by the way. All right. One of those questions you might get on an exam, it's just flat out ask you a question and it says, what is the diameter of one and a half trade size? In this case, it says one and a half inch EMT conduit. Now, this is funny because this question in this database says EMT conduit. And you and I both know that it ain't a conduit. It's a tubing. Now, if they had said one and a half inch EMT tubing, makes sense. If they had it said one and a half inch EMT raceway, makes sense. But this says conduit. Don't let that throw you. It's why I kind of do love how they do things here is to kind of let you see that you could get a question asked on the exam and it could be just appear to be a funky question. Uh, but you still got to answer it. You still got to focus uh, when you're doing the question, right? So in this case, uh, it is EMT and it's one and a half. But where are we looking for this at? Well, we're going to go to what? Back into where? Chapter nine. And we're going to be looking at the tables. Now for the raceways themselves, it's table four. For the conductors, if you were doing a raceway fill calculation, then that would be table five. Make sense? So these are just little things. Tonight, we're trying to do things to commit to memory. That's what tonight's episode's about. Not so much the index. Um, these are about memory, trying to understand, okay, if I need to find something about the raceway and the size, chapter nine, table four. If I need to do raceway fill where the conductors go in the raceway, chapter nine, table five, right? Those type of things. If I need to know the properties of a conductor, like the circular mills, then I would go, unless it's 250 KC mil and larger, then it's obviously, you know, the circular mill. But if it's smaller than that, then where am I going to go? Chapter nine, table eight. Those are the kind of things you just want to rattle around in your head and get used to it. You know what I'm saying? All right. So we're going to go to the NEC real quickly. And what we're going to go is chapter nine. Oh, what we're going to do is we got to find which article deals with uh emt all right so we're gonna go to emt and that is you go down the list here and it is oops, gotta go down a little further a little further oops hold on here I'm not showing up where is it at here hold on here okay bear with me because this these aren't scrolling very well all right, hold on. There we go. It's acting all wonky on me again. I got to say something to, here we go. Okay. So what we're going to go is we're going to go to chapter nine and we're going to be looking at table four. So here's table four, right? And just so you see it, this is the dimensions, right? So that's where we're going to be looking. So we got to make sure we're where we're at. And of course we need to go, it'll be EMT is actually the first one, by the way. So here we go. So let's scroll over a little bit so we can see. Okay, so here's EMT, right? We know the article is 358, so we can line that up. We're good to go. And we know we're in EMT, which is a tubing, okay? So our question, which was pretty straightforward, right? Our question wanted to know what was the diameter. That's it. That's all it wanted to know, okay? All right, so we'll go back over here to here, and let's see here. And it was... I believe it was an inch and a half. So we're gonna go down here and go, okay. All right, well, let's see what column do we have to be in? Right here, inch and a half. So I'm just gonna highlight these so I can keep the, the one that I'm on. Okay, so we'll keep this going. We'll keep this going. So we know which column we gotta be, all right? So that's the nominal interior diameter, you know? 
want to keep going all the way over here and this is the total area okay in square inches and you see the answer is 2.036 right so that's your answer let's go back here and we're going to choose our answer right it wants to know the diameter of inch and a half so let's go back real quick here let's let me go back here and make sure i'm um okay well first of all wait a minute that's the area we don't want the area see how quickly that could happen boom we could do that we hadn't answered the question we didn't answer the question yet this is the only one that makes a reference to the diameter the only one that makes a reference to the diameter okay all right so i'm thinking this is the answer 1.610 okay so let's go back here that is the only one that says anything about the diameter it didn't say outside diameter inside diameter it didn't say the area this is the only one in the question that had any reference to the diameter so this is an example of where you're on an exam you have got to use what's given to you and the question I, the reason i wanted to do this this set of test questions tonight was because i want you to understand how quickly you can go wonky on something and we have to really stop i could have said oh oh that's the answer because it matches the first one in here and we and that type of thing but no we we're trying to pull some triggers out here it's talking diameter there's only one thing in that column that says anything about diameter so we're going to have to assume that the person that wrote this question, since to be honest with you, they said conduit when it's really tubing, probably don't have a clue. So diameter is going to be our best choice, right? So we're going to go here and we're going to choose the 1.610. And there you go. Chapter nine, table four. Make sense? Hey, that's can sometimes, let me tell you what, folks sometimes that can trick you and so you have to get used to when you're preparing for an exam you got to get in this mode where you read the question but then go okay wait a minute let me look at this question a little closer and see if they're not trying to pull a pull a fast one on me or something like that right hey i i want you to be successful my whole job here is to try to help you be successful and i might as well tell you in order to be successful you might think about joining Fast Tracks Tube and watch some of my videos, calculation videos, right? I, I'm, just, I'm just saying, a lot of videos over there. So <laughs> I, I can't help it. Shameless plug, shameless plug. All right, let's go on and do another question real quick and see how we're going. We're going pretty good. All right. Uh-oh. Well, this one's easier for us, right? We kind of just went through this exercise. So the next, this one is, a hundred percent cross-sectional area all right so now this one's asking about the area for a one and a quarter imc okay well we're not going to fall for this trap again right we're not going to fall for this we know this one's asking for something in square inches and we know it's talking about the area so y'all already know where we're headed we're headed right back but this time we're gonna be into IMC and we're looking at an inch and a quarter and we're looking for the area, all right? So let's see here, 100% cross-sectional area, all right? So let's go to the code. All right, so let's just see here where we're at. Let's see, we're, we're trying to find, let's see here. We wanna get, we're trying to get intermediate. So here's intermediate. All right, so here's our intermediate right here, all right? And we're trying to do, I believe it was inch and a quarter. Let me double check for you. Okay, yeah, it's inch and a quarter. So we're gonna be right here in this column. I'm just gonna highlight it out right there. All right, so this is the only one. This is a total area, right? And then that's what it asks in the question, isn't it? Now look how it asks it and look how the question asks it. All right, I'll go back to the question. It wanted the 100%, that equals total. That's 100%, then it's the total, okay? So again, don't get thrown by the question, focus. 
And don't try to read in more than is necessary in, in, when you're doing this. So we're back here. And let's see, make sure I've got the right one on screen for you. Yes. So we're right here and I highlighted that column. So it looks like it's 1.643. I mean, 1.647. Dude, I'm dyslexic tonight. I am seeing numbers that are not even there. So let's go back here. And so it looks like there and there's our reference. All right. So for those that might be coming in late, these are indeed journeyman level questions, right? Um, so hopefully you uh, uh, realize though that in my years of being on code panels, in my years of helping write exams, um, don't ever get complacent that you might have, uh, let's say, something that you think is a journeyman question, right? but it actually will appear on a master exam. Yeah, it easily can happen that way. So we want to make sure you, you're always prepared for that, okay? I'd want to ask you folks out there to do me a favor and just give me a yes if you can still hear me when I go to the NF, the NEC part. Just make sure you let me know that you can still hear me. I'm still getting used to this new software. Everybody seems to like the software, but I need to make sure that when I go to the other screens that you can still hear me and it doesn't like blink out, okay? Thank you, Pooh. Appreciate you. All right, so now let's go on and do some more. Y'all are doing great. And these questions tonight are ones, again, that I want you to just try to commit to memory. Try to commit the process. These don't necessarily need the index. You just need to get used to the flow. And, uh, uh, I appreciate the comments. Uh, again, I will I, you know, highlight the, the comment. And um, you are most welcome. Uh, hopefully you get something out of what we do. Um, again, um, I got my share of haters, but at the end of the day, I don't think any of you have ever seen me do anything but try to help people. So again, can't please everybody, I reckon. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, let's do another one. Y'all are kicking it tonight so all right let's do another one all right okay good one here so you're gonna definitely get your raceways and stuff like that filled tonight okay and i've got my pen if we got to do any math i got my i got my stuff ready we'll do it i'll save you the having to do that all right so what does this one say okay so this one says rmc rigid metal conduit trade size two would have a blank square inch fill for three conductors. Okay, so we have, so we're having a percentage fill for three conductors. What would that be? So you're thinking, say, okay, well, this is rigid, and it says it's trade size two would have a blank square inch fill for three conductors. And you're thinking, hmm, how do I answer that question? It says it, it's a trade size two, and they have a certain fill for three conductors, All right? How do you answer it? Uh oh, Pooh's got an answer. Okay. All right. So let's go on and go. Let's go look here in the code. And I'm sorry I call you Pooh because it is Pooh Cat Killer. So I got to call you. I just call you Pooh. All right. So let's see. Let me share this tab here. And we're going to go to 344. And uh, let's see here. We're going to go. Let's see here. Let's see if we can't find. Let's see here. Now we're gonna to go to chapter nine, table four. And I'm trying to see where, oh, there it is. Is it rigid? Yeah. Sometimes these are wonky a little bit on this side over here. Okay. So you have over two and it's a 40%, right? And it was a trade size two. So it just simply says for over two wires, it doesn't matter. Think about this one, folks. It doesn't matter the size of the conductors. It's just asking you. You have three conductors. What's the maximum fill? What's the trade size max fill? Well, for over two conductors, 40%, it's just 40% of that raceway. We're not taking each individual conductor and seeing how many we're putting. We haven't been asked that. All we want to know is, since we're over two, and our question said three, don't let that throw you. How many times do you think on this one, Somebody might say, ah, oh, crap, I can't solve that one because you didn't give me the conductors. 
think about sitting in a class or in a on an exam and you're stressing out and you get a question like and you're going how the hell can i answer that one you told me three conductors but you didn't tell me the size and all that kind of stuff it's simple the 40 percent is the fill you can't exceed whether it's three conductors four or five six it doesn't matter you can't exceed 40 percent right so again that's kind of one of those ones that may throw you because you see them talk about three conductors and you start to go, oh, damn it. But I see it, it didn't fool y'all at all, okay? Because y'all were right on that, okay? So uh, let me go and uh, get us back to, well, let's, let's, first of all, I guess we gotta look at the answer here. So it was two right there, and there it is, 1.363. That is over two wires, and our question was three wires. So can exceed 1.363 of the square inches of volume. All right, makes sense. All right, so we'll go back to our question here, right here. And here's our reference, boom, bada boom, bada bing, easy peasy, All right? So y'all are doing great. And look, I will tell you right off, some people say these questions are too damn easy. Look, I'm telling you, these are type questions that people blow on a stressful moment in an exam. So all I'm doing tonight is I figured I would come on here live impromptu. I didn't even tell y'all I was going to do it. Okay. That's why it pays to subscribe because you never know when I'm going to go live. And yes, this isn't a recording. It is live and we're, we're using our software and hopefully y'all all like this software. Y'all saw it last night when I debuted it and, uh, Hopefully y'all think it's still all the bomb because I like it. It's pretty nice. Now I know some of you are gonna say, well, I'd like for the, for the stuff to be a little bigger on the screen. Eh, it is, it, it, it's a work in progress. I'll figure something out with that. But it, right now it's lacking some functionality that I would like. In other words, I'd like to have the ability to share multiple screens, but right now it only lets you score, share one screen. But this is a new company and they're adding stuff all the time. So I am sure that they will expand and make it better. And that means my streams will get better. Everything will get better, right? But I am committed to them. They, they are a young company. EVMUX is the name of the company. Kind of a weird ass name. Uh, I am actually live Swartzy. Dr. Swartz is in the house. Um, so cool. All right, let's, uh, let's do another question. Y'all are awesome tonight. There you go. Okay, next question. Again, I don't wanna see you get these wrong on an exam, so let's do this. The cross-sectional area of a 12 AWG THWN-2 conductor is blank square inches, okay? So what do you think about this one? All right, so this one, now we've shifted gears. Remember, things to commit to memory. Now we're talking about the conductor and it's asking about the area of a conductor. It's asking me all of that type of stuff. And it says square inches, okay, which is a trigger for us. That makes us know that it's not in millimeters. It's not in cubic inches. It's square inches. I end with a little two above it, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. But since this is talking about a conductor, where are we gonna go in the code? Remember, we just did the raceways. That was in chapter nine, table four. Now we're talking conductors, chapter nine, table what? Table five, that's it. memory. Commit that, commit that type of stuff to memory. So let's go. So we're talking about a 12 THWN. So let's go on and get our code book here. And let's go on and get to, let's see here. Let's go to, here we go. So here's uh, table five. And so we'll just kind of go down first and see what we're doing here. So we said THWN. And so it's none of these, none of that. Let's keep going. Ah, here we go. THWN right here. Boom, right there. And it's 12, right? Right there. So here's what we first got to figure out. We're going to highlight this real quick. And then we'll go up and we'll kind of move our way to the right. Because these are millimeters. We don't, we don't want anything to do with that. All right, so we're going to... We, we're still highlighted right there, so we know we're in the right column. All right, so let me go down here real quick, and let's move us a little bit to the right here. Still in the conductors, and let's move up. Ours should still be highlighted. 
There it is right there. It's still highlighted. There's the 12. And there's the approximate area, okay? And I want to show you something before we go anywhere. I just want to show you real quick. If I go just further to the right, I want to show you why it's a different, why it makes a difference. See where this is diameter? And you see it's not square inches? Don't fall into the trap, folks. You need to be in here, square inches, right here. All right? Just kind of keeping it real. It can happen very quickly. And so we're going to go back up here. And I don't think it's highlighted anymore. So I'll go to the left so I can reference our THHN. Sorry, this is the way it is on my screen. So it's right here. All right. And we know that those two on the right, this right here, the 0 0.0133, that is definitely in the square inches. So we're going to come back down. And that's the 12 right there at 0 0.0133. And just to prove it, we're going to go to the left. And there it is, 12. All right. So we'll go back to the question. There we go. So it is right there. Beam, bada boom, bada bang. There you go. Chapter 9, table 5. Just that easy, folks. Okay. Okay. Uh, Okay, let's go do another one because I am very pleased with how everything's going. Remember, folks, if you want to support us over on Fast Tracks Tube, it's right up there at the top. You can get your 50% off, limited time. It's under 50 bucks. You can get an annual membership to Fast Tracks Tube. Uh, we've got a bunch of things planned, and I've got some, well, I'm not going to talk about those things that we got planned, uh, but you can also get to Wednesday nights if you're not a Fast Track student. But you want to come to Wednesday nights and join us live, then all you got to do is subscribe to Fast Tracks Tube. And then once you subscribe for the annual, use that coupon code, then you'll be able to come and join us on Wednesday nights. And the link will be in Fast Tracks Tube. So don't worry. All right. Let's do another one. Doing amazing. All right. As you can see, the tone tonight, folks, this is the tone we got going on tonight. All right. The cross sectional area of a one ot XHHW compact aluminum conductor is, and again, we're talking square inches, okay? So what's the difference in this question? Well, the key difference that you have here is it's compact aluminum, okay? Big difference when you're talking about compact aluminum, okay? Right? So you have to remember, okay, what table deals with that? So remember, Here's things to remember. Chapter nine, table four is for the raceways. That's where you can find the, the, the maximum percentage for fill, all that there, right? For each different raceway. Table five is the conductor properties as far as the area and all that kind of stuff. Well, guess what? This is compact. So there's another table for that and it's still five but it's 5A. So just remember, compact 5A. Regular aluminum, regular copper, table five. Just kind of commit those things to memory. If you get a question that's asking you about the areas and stuff like that, okay? So now if it was asking you for what the circular mill was, then you go to chapter nine, table eight, because that's the circular mill, okay? We're trying to find this value in square inches, okay? So let's go to the code and try to answer this one. And so we're going to go, so we're going to be looking under compact. So here, you notice it says compact copper and aluminum. Uh, now, a little, little tip for you. We do not see a lot of uh, compact copper in the industry, right? Uh, typically, because you're not going to really get any benefit from the compact copper. Now, compact aluminum, you do get a benefit. You know why? Because typically when you have concentric stranding or all the little round strands, you get these little voids between each one of the strands, right? And that takes up volume. Mm -hmm. Now, if you do compact aluminum, 
that it basically creates these trapezoids, right? And it causes the conductors to mesh together and it acts like a solid conductor, yet it's made up of these interlocking trapezoids. So it means that overall, if you lose all those voids in there, then you know the conductor overall is gonna get smaller. Well, that's a benefit when it comes to compact aluminum because since aluminum can't carry the same amount of current as copper, and you're value engineering a project and maybe you're going with copper, but you want to say, look, I, I need to save money or I need a lighter weight. Maybe it's running vertical. I want to go with aluminum. Okay. Well, if a certain amps for copper, you try to find the equivalent in aluminum, it's going to be a bigger size aluminum. But if you get compact and you get rid of all those little interstices, those little voids, then it gets a little closer to the size of aluminum. It's not exactly, but it gets a little closer to it and it may fit in your raceway better. So that's why it's a benefit to use the compact table if it is indeed compact aluminum, all right? So let's go look at it real quick. So this was one aught and it was XHHW, okay? So here's your compact table right here. Just kind of let you see what it is, all right? And what we're doing is the question was asking about the area because we're asking about uh, square inches, right? So you know you're gonna be in this column didn't say anything about diameters and anything, that type of thing. So we're looking in here, right? Approximate area. We're really trigger on this right here in the question. It was asking about square inches, okay? All right, so what we've got to do is we've got to find, we're, we know that this is the column right here. We'll just kind of, we'll kind of do, let's see, let's just do this so we can keep an eye on what column we're in. And I'll move to the left and we need one out right here. So we got one knot is right underneath this line. So we're going to go over here to the right. So this is where we want to be. All right. So it is 0 0.1963. Scroll up. There's your square inch. So you know you're in the right place. But what is, what is it asking? Is it asking for THWN? Or is it asking for XHHW? Ah, ha, ha. Quickly that can happen, right? So let's go over and let's get in the right column, right? And now we can come down. And since we do have the sizes over here, we don't have to do a whole lot. We're in TH we're area. Here we go. See how quickly? You could be so quick because we know that answer was there. But let's go down here and it was about one odd. That's the actual answer. 0 0.1590. My point being, folks, is you've got to pay attention to your headers. Be sure you're in the right column. And then you can focus on the sizes. So 0 0.1590. Beautiful thing. Let's go back. Boom. There you go. Chapter 9, Table 5A. Okay, folks, you see how I do this? See how I go? We look at something. We start going down and we go, wait a minute, that's not XHHW. And I do these things because I really want you to focus on the columns you're in, the headers of the columns, and it's that quick that you can make a mistake. And that's the last thing, and look, in a test, it's gonna be stressful anyway. So if I can show you all these things that could possibly happen, don't you think maybe that when you're in the stressful environment of a test, you're gonna be like, oh shit, I remember what Paul said. And I'm not, I'm going to double check myself. I'm not going to be so quick. Boom, boom, boom. Um, and as Will Ferrell would say, bing, bang, boom. I'm not going to do it that way. I'm taking your time. Okay. All right. Go to another one. Dude, y'all are rocking it tonight. All right. Here we go, folks. Aluminum conductors of size 400 Casey mill have blank strands per conductor. Okay. What do you think? How many strands per conductor? Well, we're talking stranded, okay? So remember earlier I said a table to keep in mind was the actual properties of a conductor. Actual properties of the conductor are gonna be where? Chapter nine, table eight. See what we're doing tonight? Chapter nine, table four, raceways in the percentage of fill. Chapter nine, table five, conductor properties when it comes to the area of the properties. Get it? I think you get it.
Chapter nine, table five A, compact. Next, chapter nine, table eight, stranding question. But it's also about the properties. Now, of course, we don't need to know how many circular mills this is because it's 400 KC mill. That's 400,000. The K means thousand, 400,000 circular mills. But we need to know about the stranding, okay? And I love some of the stuff that I'm seeing here. Uh, in the answers here that people are posting, poo killer, cat killer, whatever that is. Um, I like in your quick responses, okay? Oh, you got a test tomorrow. You're ready, dude. You are ready. You have mind meld with you. You are ready. You're gonna, you got this. I want you to go in there strutting your stuff, looking around at everybody that's testing in there and look at them and go, what's up, dog? You need any help? Because you're probably gonna struggle, but I'm not gonna struggle. That's what I want you to go in there like that. All right, so let's go to the NEC and we'll go to conductor properties. So you can see where I'm at right here. Table eight, conductor properties, right? All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go down and let's see if we can get here and let's go back over here to the left. All right, so you notice there is quantity. Quantity of what? Quantity of stranding. Okay. Now one represents solid conductors, by the way, folks. Seven represents stranding. This is normal, typical ASTM B stranding. Okay. So our question was for a 400 KC mil right here. All right. So typical, that's a 37 strand. All right. Now you can go down here and you'll see all bunch of different notes here. You see right here, class B stranding is listed. Uh, as well as solid for some sizes. Uh, that is typically a the normal building wire that the NEC deals with. Just kind of remember, most of that stranding class is going to be a class B, unless stated otherwise. Now, if you get like fine strands and things like that, the strand count's gonna be much higher, but that's not what this table deals with, okay? All right, so we'll come back to the question. And 37 strands, boom. Chapter nine, table eight, and you folks nailed that uh, in, the, uh, in the chat. All right, let's do another one. Okay, and notice how I'm going through each one of these little tables and each one of these things to try to help you. This one, again, think about this one. I now wanna know what the cross-sectional area of a bear, it's not an insulated conductor, it is a bear 12 AWG conductor, okay? You see all these questions tonight? Why we're doing these questions this way is I am stacking up the knowledge for you so that these things become boom, 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 right? So where do we go? Where do we go to find properties conductors again? You guessed it, chapter nine, table eight. Now the difference here is we're looking at bare conductors, but it's still a property question. It's still asking me about the area of a conductor, right? So again, that's where we wanna go. So we're gonna go to the NEC. And we're still here, chapter nine, table eight. And of course the question was about a 12. Here's a 12 right here. And let's see here. So we're going to look at this one here and it wants to know what the cross section area is. So it's a 12. So let's kinda, uh, let's see here move a little bit to the right here if it'll let me let me go on and let me see if it'll let me highlight across here hold on here okay so there we'll go up and see where we're at so this is the dc uh all this goody stuff here and let me move back to where i need to be hold on for a second folks i hate the fact that i got to do this but you know what small price to pay all right so this is the area where you need to be at. so we're looking at what we're looking at area versus diameter it's talking about the area now here's the next thing that you might say okay paul so this was solid right and this is stranded the question said a 12 bare solid now there's somebody out there i guarantee you that might have said well how do you know which one it is bare or solid it's because we read the question really quickly and in this case, it said solid. But another thing to be aware of on an exam, if it didn't tell you that, 
it may not give you both answers for solid and stranded, right? So you pick the one that gives you an answer based on which one, okay? So if they had given you both here, 0 0.006 and 0 0.005, well then you know the question wanted the one that's solid. If it hadn't said solid, and it gave you 0 0.006, but it didn't give you 0 0.005, then you know that it must be talking about a stranded, even though it didn't say stranded. Again, folks, the key here is to use the answers to drive you, right? And so in this case, it doesn't matter. This is a no brainer. We know it's 0 0.005, so that's what we're gonna answer. So we come back here, boom, boom, chapter nine, table eight. Again, bare, solid, 12 gauge. Gave you everything you needed to know. And the trigger for this was when it said cross this area, you know when they're asking about the properties of a conductor. Another way to remember this is that they didn't tell you anything about insulation. So you know you're not going to be in table, uh, table nine, uh, chapter nine, table five, right? Because it didn't say a thing about any insulation. And all those conductors in chapter nine, table five, deal with insulated conductors, okay? So you know the moment you saw that bear and you saw the cross-sectional area, think uh, chapter nine, table eight. Always think of it that way. Make sense? All right, let's do another one. All right. Okay, we're back to some regular code stuff. Hopefully you found that helpful as I kind of walked you through those tables. Um, we're not gonna do raceway fill on this episode, but as I've said many times, folks, if you join Fast Tracks Tube, there is a raceway fill video in there that you can watch. And we go, I go in depth in it. Also up there, if you didn't know it, Derating Demystified 3.0 is now available over in Fast Tracks 2. If you didn't know that, the latest edition of the Derating Demystified that teaches you about continuous loads, teaches about adjustments and corrections and all that, that is available 3.0. And there is another episode of that coming out. That's an ongoing series. I'm going to talk about MC cables and bundling and all that. And that's the next one that's going to come out this weekend. Okay. Only available over at Fast Tracks Tube. Well worth the price of mission. Use that coupon code, save you a little money. And uh, we'd love to have you in the Fast Track Tube family. All right. Next question. Everybody seems to be answering it already. So let's see if I can get here. Okay. So the question is blank or not required to have GFCI protection. Okay. So let's do a process of elimination here. Uh, I like doing processes of elimination. Okay. First of all, all of these things, boathouses, attic spaces, bat, one of them obviously sticks out. Whether or not you get into the semantics of anything, one obviously sticks out. Um, but we have boathouses, attic spaces, bathrooms, and then wet bar sinks. Okay. And so obviously when we say wet bar sinks, it's it must be within six feet of the sink because otherwise what would be the point, right? So if we're used to process, and we know boat houses require GFCI and we know bathrooms require GFCI. So this is one of those ones that I talk about. And, if, and uh, I'm telling you what, poo, if you get this on your exam, you ought to answer this one within two seconds. And guess what? You just giving yourself over a minute and a half to use on a different question. That's the beauty of a three-wave method. Go through without even opening your code book, that first wave, see how many you can answer right away off the top of your head that you feel 100% confident. When you get to one you don't think you can answer or you can't answer it within a minute, then you tick it or mark it and then go on to the next one. You wanna answer as many as you can in that first wave. That way you now have reduced the number of questions down and now you can focus, okay? All right, that's the way you do the multi, the three-wave method, by the way, okay? All right, so let's kind of look at this one here. So, all right, so the first thing is where do we find the GFCI requirements? Well, you could go to the index and look under GFCI, ground fault circuit interrupter protection, or you should know all these locations it's really talking about are, are basically going to be in 210.8. And since all of these locations are dwellings or probably associated 
with the dwelling because it doesn't say anything otherwise it doesn't say commercial boat out so we're going to pretty much assume that all these locations um, are probably going to be in a dwelling application the best chess best it's so much easier to not pick apart the whoever wrote the question and say well i'm just going to go with i know it's 210.8 because that's gfci protection that applies to the majority of these here so that's where i'm going to go okay now i'm again y'all all know the answer but we're going to go look it up in the code okay so let me go here all right so we're in the code and we know that we're going to go to 210.8 we can get past all these definitions i don't know if y'all knew that the 2023 code uh every definition now is going into article 100 it has gotten very big but at least it's all in one place how about that all right so i'm gonna go to 210.8 all right and so 210.8 most certainly is our gfci requirements right okay yes jose i will repeat that in a minute so let me answer this question and i will repeat that three-phase method again uh, uh let's see here okay so let's see here so here's 210.8 and we might as well get an a for dwellings and there's the bathroom ones check uh there's the the, the sinks or oh, there's boat houses okay there we go and here's areas with a sink or permanent provisions for food preparation okay cooking yep good so the only thing i don't see in here to be honest with you the only thing i don't see in here is anything to do with attic space i now knew that one up front y'all knew that right away okay and as far as a wet bar sink we're just going to consider that a sink based on what we have based on the list you can't have two answers but we know attic is not in here so that's the best choice and y'all already knew that okay now if it had been crawl space then okay then we could start getting to semantics right but right now nope best possible answer so let's go back to the question here we're gonna go with addicts and boom 210.8a okay all right so real quickly i will go back to uh let's see here let's go back to me really quickly so i can explain this to uh jose mm -hmm. okay so the three-way method goes like this when you get into your exam, you watch all the pre-stuff that tells you, okay, the sky is blue, the grass is green. It gives you all these reminders of stuff and you get prepared, you're getting set up and you're feeling comfortable. When it's time to start, you're gonna go through the questions. Usually it's electronic. You're gonna go through the questions and the first way you're gonna to try to answer as many of the questions that you can that you know, just you know the answer. If you get to a question and it's just so simple and you answer it within seconds, boom, you mark it, your answer, and go to the next question. If the next question's taking you, you know, 30 seconds to a minute and you still can't find it, then it is not a first wave question. There's a little feature most of the time that you can checkbox it and for review later. Go on and check it and now just skip it and go to the next question. You want to try to, on the first wave, answer as many questions as you can without having to go through your code book. Now, you wouldn't be bad if you just forget the 30 seconds and forget the one minute on the first wave. If you feel confident, answer the question. If you, and if you answer it, go to the next one. If you don't know it right away, check it. Go to the next one. If you don't know that one, check it. Go to the next one. The first wave, I really want you to go through and try to answer as quick as possible everything that you know that you know right everything that you put a check mark on because it's electronic it allows you to mark them or put a little tick on them when you finish it'll say do you want to go back to all the questions that you marked that's your second wave now you click that and you go back and you review all the ones that you marked that you couldn't find in the first wave or that you realized wasn't a first wave question that you couldn't answer right away now you're going to spend a little more time on these so here you're going to spend anywhere from about a minute and a half on these two minutes max but a minute and a half again you're not monitoring that you just you'll get a feel for how long you spend but if you start getting that anxiety feeling that you're spending too much time on that question leave it ticked don't untick it leave it ticked go to the next question in the second wave when you do answer one of them when you spend a little more time on it then you want to untick it after you answer it and then go to the next one Okay. Then after you've gone through there, any of them that you've unticked are not going to be in your list anymore. 
Then when you get to the end, you'll have certain ones that are still ticked. That's when you go back and review the ticked ones again from the beginning. And these are the ones that you're going to, that third wave, you're going to spend up to two minutes each. Now, at the end of that two minutes or approximately two minutes, you'll get a feel for it. You've got to answer the question. So you need to at least give an answer. If you still don't feel it's the right, you, you're still not 100% sure, then leave it ticked and go to the next question. But at least answer the question. In the third wave, you do not want to leave any question unanswered. Whether you got to use deductive reasoning, whether you got to use good logic, whether you need to look at four questions and remove two you know are wrong, and now you got a 50 50 chance. In that third wave, you're not going to leave a question until you've answered it. If you don't know if you're 100% right, then still leave it marked. It's not going to matter. Go to the next question. But if you do answer it in that third wave, make sure you uncheck it and go to the next question. Okay. But in the first wave, just answer everything you know right off the top of your head. In the second wave, answer those that you can answer up to two minutes. And if you do answer it, uncheck it and then go to the next one. In that third wave, you're going to go to all the ones that are still checked, spend up to two minutes on each one of those. If you can answer it, answer it and uncheck it. But before you go to the next question, you're gonna answer it whether you're guessing or not, okay? Because if you don't know by then, you don't know but you're gonna at least leave it checked, okay? But you gotta at least answer it before you go to the next question, even if you leave it checked. Now, the reason we do that is, you know what? Just because I call it the three-wave method. If you've got a bunch of time left over, dude, now it's the four-wave method. Go back and do them again, and now you'll be singling out the ones that you answered, but you were still a little fuzzy on. And then if you finally spend that extra time then if you get it, you can uncheck it. The point is this, you need to build some time. And I want you to take all of the time for your exam. I don't want you to try to set a record. I don't want you to try to get in and get out of there too quickly. I want you to use all the time you can, unless you go through all the methods and you get to the end and you uncheck everything at the last wave, the third wave, and you're like, well, shit, there's no reason for me to stay. I'm, this is the best I'm gonna get. Submit that thing, don't second guess yourself, and get the hell out of there. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, that's what we're trying to do. Okay. Um, so, um, let's see here. One thing to remember, Jose, your test is tomorrow. Or is it Jose or Josie? Is it Jose? Um, one of the things to remember, if it, is it Josie, give me a one. If it's Jose, give me a two. If I'm totally wrong, give me a three. Um, so, the one of the things that I wanna tell you is don't go in there stressed, you've got this. And if you haven't studied really well, then you need to make that three-wave method, at least it's a plan, you know what I'm saying? At least it's a plan of attack to feel more comfortable. It's like I teach people a structured way to learn the code. There is a structured way to do an exam and that's the way. Okay, we say three wave because that's the three most important waves. But if you've got time, you can add a fourth wave. You can even add a fifth wave if you've got time. But the first three waves are gonna dictate. And just remember, you have that option to mark a question and unmark a question so that you can catch it on the second wave. You're just gonna go to all the questions that you've marked, okay? Joe is even easier, I'd rather say Joe. Thank you, Joe. All right, hopefully that made, that made sense what I said there. All right, let's do another one here. All right, got another one, folks. Y'all are doing great, by the way. All right, boat docks and marinas are required to install blank at approaches to the facility. What do you think it is? Is it safety signs, LED lighting, AFCI devices, or A, B, or C? Okay, so we're talking about boat docks and marinas, okay, are required to install blank at approaches to the facility. What do you think? All right. So first of all, you have to identify where is marinas. Let's see who can get me there. Who can get me there? Where are where are marinas in the National Electrical Code? I got time to wait. I don't have any music. I need to get some more music. Like do I'm gonna bring, bring Swartzy on 
just so he can do the noise. Ooh. Okay, anyway. I'd like to think I'm the Vanna White of code. I mean, Pat Sajak of code, whatever. Whatever. One of them. All right? And my haters will call me the Vanna White, but uh, people that like me will call me the Pat Sajak. All right, so what do you think the answer is here? Well, first thing I'm going to do is I could go to the NEC. Now, I don't have index because Link Schwartzy in the house. <laughs> I could go into the back of the index and, you know, link doesn't give us an index. So that's why I'm not using the index tonight, but you could use the index. Uh, let's see here. I might go back to Marina's and see what's in, what's, what's in the back under Marina's. So I'm going to do that since we got some time. I'm going to go back in the back and look in the back here. And let's see under Marina, see if there's anything under Marina's. All right, I'm in the back on the marinas. Okay, so we know that it's Article 555, like Schwartzy said. Very good. Now I'm going to look down and see, okay, what am I looking for? The question is trying to talk about some approaches or something. So um, I'm looking and I'm going, what the hell could it be really talking about? And I'm just kind of looking down to see. All right, well, hold on. The question says boat docks and marinas, right? So I'm looking down. Okay. Well, let's see here. Mm, I don't. I don't see anything that that sticks out to me, right? So everybody knows what's Paul's first rule. What's Paul's first rule when the index isn't helpful? What's Paul's first rule? See if Swartzy gets it. What's Paul's first rule is to look at it and do what when you're looking at the index, uh, when you're looking at the index and you see, looking at the numbers. What's Paul's first rule? There's a technique that we call, is a special name for it. I've been calling it for years uh, and it's the obvious, but it's what you're gonna do when you notice that it's not a really big section, okay? There's some little technique that we do other than using the index, okay? We'll see if he gets it. Now, while he's doing that, I'm going to look real quick under anything under boat because that is part of what we do when we call, I'm not going to say it because I'll say what it means. There you go, Swartzy, dude. That's my boy. All right. So it's definitely called bold scanning. It's a technique. When you notice that your the article is very small and you're looking for something very specific and you're going to use the answers that are in your question, then you want to remember to do that. So real quick though, I'm going to look under boat just to see if there's anything under boat. I see boat yards um, and that's, a, that's about it. Boat yards and that doesn't do me, that doesn't really do anything. Then it sends me to marinas where I was already at. So none of that's helpful. Okay, so what I would do is I would go to 555. That's how I would do it. So we're going to do that. So I'm going to go to the NEC and we're going to go to 555 because that is Marina's. Thank you to Dr. Schwartz. And if we were bold scanning, folks, this is what we'd be doing. We'd be looking at the headers. All right, glancing in here. And remember, our answers are safety signs, LED lighting, or AFCI devices, or all three. So I'm looking, I'm bold scanning. So this is what you're bold scanning for. None of this stuff, and you see how quickly you do it? None of this stuff is germane to the question. Nope. Uh-oh, wait a minute. Permanent safety signs. It said safety signs in our question. It's another thing you got to get used to, folks. You got to get used to being able to lock things from the questions into your mind so that as you're bold scanning, you're really multitasking. You're looking over to see if any of your answers in the question are also in the, con the, 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 the material, okay? So I did that and I see safety signs, all right? So it says permanent safety signs shall be installed to give notice of electric shock risk to persons using or swimming near the docking facility, boat yard or marina and shall comply with the following, okay? All right, so the signage. The signs shall be clearly visible from all approaches to the marina, docking facilities, boatyard facility. Okay, 
All right, and then once you hit here, it just kind of goes beyond that. So it's obviously signage, right? No brainer. So we'll go back here. So obviously we know it's safety signs. There it is, 555.10. Again, um, the, the, the index is not the holy grail and that's why we chose to do it this way tonight so that we could get used to certain things. And that is some things you just need to get familiar with. And remember, 555 is small, bold scan. Um, let's see. Um, some of the other stuff is very small, and you know, boom, I'm just going to go there and start bold scanning it. Don't spend forever flipping through the index, and that's something you're going to get used to because you could spend half your damn lookup time in an index, and you could have found it by just bold scanning going right to uh, the freaking article. Okay, And it'll get better. It just takes you a little bit of getting used to that but you'll get it. And I will tell you that also helps you in the field too, because a lot of times you're in the field and you don't want to spend all this time and you know where to go because you've gotten used to it. Then boom, you go there and you bold scan and you can find your answer, that type of thing. All right, let's do another question. You're doing great. All right. A recessed luminaire that is not IC rated must clear combustible materials by what? Half inch, three quarter inch, one inch, or one and a half inch? What do you think? Okay, so this is not ICC rated. Now IC rating means in contact. So this is obviously not to be in contact, right? So where do you think you would go? Okay, so first of all, you gotta identify what you're talking about. What are we talking about? Well, well, we're obviously talking about a luminaire. That's a no brainer. All right, but well, we're talking about recessed type of luminaires. All right, so I could go to my index again. You can do it too. And oh, by the way, folks, um, we will be, we're gonna be adding a second, uh, I know I've got like five cameras, but I took them down when I did the new system with all the big screens. Um, but we definitely are gonna be adding more cameras and I'm gonna be adding my camera. You can't see it, but see this thing right here? This is a camera that's gonna be down and that's gonna be allowing us to go into the code book and you to see exactly how I go through the code book. Yep, we got all that stuff planned with this new software. So woo, 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 we'll have another camera that pops up on the screen so we can actually go to the code book cam, okay? All right, so if I were to go to the index and I go under luminaries, I'm just going to go under luminaries. And y'all remember when it was so easy, it was just light fixtures, right? Then we had to get all fancy, whatnot. All right, so luminaries, we're going to go under luminaries. And right now I'm going to be looking and see if there's anything under having to do with recess. Yes, it says recess luminaries. So I'm going to have to go to recessed, okay? So I'm going to go to recess luminaries. So that was real quickly. Didn't take me but a second to realize that. So now I'm going to go over to recessed. Luminaries, and now that you know that, you'll never go to luminaries for recess. You'll always go to recess. So I'm gonna go to recess luminaries. Okay, so that tells us that that is 410 part X. Ooh, ooh. All right. So if I go down a little further, it says clearance installation. Well, hello, that is 410.116. Boom, bada, bing, bang, boom. We're gonna go there. So I'm gonna go to the NEC. And we're going to go to 410, and we're going to go to part 10 in 410. We already know to go to 116, but we're just going to show you the parts here. Let me go to the part. There we go. We're in part 10. Recess luminaries. Okay. Clearances. Non-IC. There you go. A recess luminaire that is not identified for contact, that is IC in contact, okay? That's what that means. And it's not, shall have a recess space of not less than a half of an inch from combustible material, okay? I know most of, the, most of the ones I see today are IC rated, but hey, you don't know. You might go pick up a set from China, okay? Oops, that was, I was gonna have a neat, neat sound. All right, that was it. Well, you can pick up China, sponsored by TikTok, and uh, then you can do that. So anyway, let's go back here to our tab. Half inch, there it is. 110.116A1. Bada bing, bada boom. Dude, oh, 
are killing it tonight. All right. Next one. A luminary or luminaire that weighs more than blank must be supported independent of the box. All right. So now we're going to do a little deductive logic here. So we know the different weights that we're tuned into, right? We know that the, I have never once seen in the code a reference to 25. I have, um, I know, I, I can't, I just haven't put any sounds on it because I'm, I'm just lazy. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. I do have some sounds. Wait a minute. Watch. Hold on. You ready? So see, Swartzy, I am up stepping up my game a little bit, but we got a bunch more we got to add. Jesse would be proud if he was here. At least I had some new sounds there. All right. So what's the deal? So look, we're familiar with, we've heard about 50 pounds. We've seen that in the code before in 314. We've even heard a mention of 35 pounds before in the NEC. We don't really hear about 40 and we really don't hear about the 25. So as the more you work through our Fast Tracks program, these things will just be inherent. But if you're not in our program, you probably never heard of box issues with, 30, uh, with uh, 40 or 25. So now you narrowed it down to either it's 35 or 50, okay? So that's a 50-50, okay? So in my case, this is a no-brainer because again, we're looking for support, okay? So a luminaire that weighs more than certain poundage has to be independently supported. Okay, well, we could go to the index or we could go to 314 because that deals with boxes. But if you want to go to the index, okay, it's probably going to be under boxes. Okay, I'm using the index more than I wanted to use tonight. Um, and I, again, will appeal out to NFPA. Do me a favor. Go on and add the index to link. I know y'all got a search feature uh, and y'all never listen to me. I get it, okay? But it would be so nice if you put the index into link so that we can use that as educators. Uh, anyway, so I'm at boxes really quickly and what I'm trying to look for is and see anything about support in here. So I'm looking down to see where it might get me and I'm looking at PQR. Uh, let's see here if I see anything securing. Okay. All right. Securing and supporting. Well, there's a 300.11. We know that that has nothing to do with the boxes because that's in 300. Then there's a 314.23. Eh, not really where we want to be, but I mean, it's, it's something. Oh, ah. But then we go down and we see wall or ceiling. Okay. Well, the box, it's under boxes and it goes in a wall or ceiling, kind of covers both of these really. And then it says 314.27a. Okay, well that's probably a more logical place that I would be going because this box is gonna go in either a wall or a ceiling. And I would assume there's probably gonna be other requirements along with that there anyway. So for my money, that's where I'm gonna start my bold scan journey is 314.27. All right, so I'm gonna go there. <coughs> so let's do this. I'm gonna go to link. And I'm gonna go to 314 because we are talking about boxes. You identified that in the question. And let's go to 314. And if you were to bold scan, I'm gonna show you how quickly this is. Because 314 is not that big. Really, it isn't. So bold scan, bold scan, bold scan. Metal boxes had nothing to do with the question. That's secures and fastening of the boxes, not about supporting. There's your installation. There's 314.16. That doesn't really tell me anything. That's all about box fill, all that goody goody stuff. Uh, this is about conductors entering. See how I'm both scanning it quickly? Got nothing to do with it. Plus, you notice there's no poundage in the question. Remember what I said about getting used to kind of scanning the actual content for the code? because you're looking for something that's either 35, 40, 50, or 25. Use the questions to your advantage. That's another little tip that people forget about. All right, so none of this deal with that. Surfing extensions, nothing. Okay, 
supports. All right, so immediately I go down and the first thing I'm looking for is I'm going, uh, let's see, down here and I got 23. I was like, okay, is it under 23? No, I'm not seeing anything in here that's that's really giving me fundamental. That's just about the cubic inches and what's, so it's nothing really there. Uh, nothing with the poundages, right? So I'm just kind of boogieing on down, nothing there. Covers and canopies, nah. Outlet boxes, ah. Okay, so we're talking about we're talking about an, an outlet box, whether a lighting outlet goes on or a receptacle device goes in an outlet box. Vertical surface mountings, ah. So let's talk about weight uh, uh, support of independent box. All right. Well, first thing I'll tell you, it doesn't take your brain surgeon to do this. Only thing you see is fifty, and then down here for the ceilings, fifty, fifty right stop okay it tells you right here the maximum weight of luminaire that's, that's permitted to be supported by the box if other than 50 pounds okay down here boxes shall be required to support a luminaire weighing a minimum of 50 pounds a luminaire that weighs more than 50 shall be supported independently of the outlet box boom you're done folks let's go back to the question Boom, 50. There it is, 314.27A1. So bold scanning can be your friend, but the reason that we could skip over those other ones that try to lure you in is because we did not see the answer in the code text. So you're going to have to get used to fluidly looking at it, okay? Because again, you're going to get questions on the exam that may not be as detailed as you'd like it to be, but you need to use what they give you. And so in this case, we were able to use the questions themselves at, to our advantage, okay? All right, let's do them all. And I'm about ready to end it here tonight, but I just wanted to, to do a, a quick one for you tonight. All right, receptacles in bathrooms must be installed within blank feet of the edge of each basin. Again, phase one, you're going that question, you do wave one, you know the answer to this. You all know the answer to this. If I answered this in two seconds, all that extra remaining time can now be used for another question when we go to, to the second wave. You see how that works? That's how it works. And a lot of times going through our Fast Tracks program, you're gonna learn so many of these things that you don't even have to think about it. It's just like boom, 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 just like that. And just imagine the amount of time you're gonna build up. And what that does is that relaxes you. Okay, and if you go in there and you're not sure and you're all over the place, I can tell you there's been a many a person out there that probably opened up that exam, right? And I need you to be more confident than that, Joe, than a question mark. I need you to be confident, not question. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Okay. All right, so, all right. Well, we're about to end, puffing ass. <laughs> You should have had it the first time, but again, I'll give you, I will tell you, I did not give you a warning that I was coming on. So again, you get a pass. Um, okay. So I don't know what I was talking about. So I, again, I have a, a attention deficit disorder. So I go from one thing and I'll be talking about something, trying to prove a point and then mixing up. I'm off to something else. So whatever I was at, somebody wants to redirect me, focus, focus, focus on the question. So in this case, um, you got to realize that it, it's pretty straightforward. If you answer this one right away on that first wave within a second or two, then you've got plenty of time to apply it to another question, right? So this one is a no brainer, easy one. So it's asking about the bathroom receptacle. Now, one of the triggers here that I want you to get familiar in a question like this. So in a question like this, it's asking for the receptacles placement. Remember the Holy Grail, and you know this is a branch circuit because that's what you run to the receptacles, right? Remember that in a question like this, you got to get savvy enough to look at this and say, this is asking about a branch circuit, and this is a distance question, a spacing question. All of these are in the Holy Grail of 210.52. Now, this one's specific to the bathroom receptacle, but this is part of that 
holy grail that 210.52 wall spacing receptacle spacing and all that kind of, all within that same realm right 210.52a is your wall spacing generally uh, 210.52b and c are receptacles and kitchens and things like that so again it's all in the same area right so let's kind of go to the code and what we're going to do is we're going to go to 210.52 like i said and think of it this as spacing stuff so i'm gonna go real clicky to spacing i'm gonna go to 210.52 all right and we're starting at that and then i'm gonna bold scan down until i see bathrooms okay all right so i'm gonna move down there small appliances bold scan bold scan counter boom 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 keep going bathrooms okay quickly i saw three feet that was in our question we can ignore the 12 inches because that is nothing part of the question and it says at least one receptacle outlet shall be installed in bathrooms within three feet of the outside edge of each sink okay three feet so it's like that is a no-brainer so boom we'll come back here three feet there it is 210.52d okay hopefully hopefully it made sense to you okay so again folks about an hour and a half we did this huh uh yeah rewind it back uh i love to say that rewind it back puff ass and uh watch it again <laughs> watch it again um you know that when you watch my videos and i do these you can always pause the video answer the question and then play the video so that's a good way to use it. And that's what I recommend for everybody that goes and watches our videos and stuff over on Fast Tracks Tube to make sure that you get the most out of these videos, right? Pause it, answer it, then hit play. And if you can't visit with us live. And even then in live, I may go really too fast for you. So again, no matter how many times you do this, it's okay if you know the answer. It's moving in and out of the code book you'll get better. And the more you do, it's like anything. You all didn't become amazing electricians because you sat in the basement. You got out and you worked with your hands, right? We're working on the mental part, but the physical part, you did that over and over and over again, right? That's how you got better. What's well, the same thing with code? You do it over and over again. It doesn't matter if you're doing the same question or doing the same database of questions over and over again doesn't matter okay now our fast track system has well over a thousand plus i think it's like 1500 questions whether it's the competency reviews that i grade whether or not it's the quizzes whether or not it's the databases that we provide there's a tons of questions there for you to hone those skills don't be in such a hurry to answer questions now a lot of people say well i'm preparing for an exam when do i time myself when you get down to the last two weeks before an exam, then I give you permission to start timing yourself. How do you do that? Just take a question, get your phone, right? Get your phone, okay? Set the timer for two minutes, right? I'll show you, watch. This is exactly how I do it when I'm doing this in some of my live sessions with students. All right, I go into the timer, if I can find it. There we go. So I go into the timer, I hit the timer, and I set it, I already have it set. You can see that. See, it's already set for two minutes because that's what I do. And say, so I get the question on the screen, right? And I go start. And then I try to answer the question. And if I answer the question, I hit, I hit pause. If I don't answer it in two minutes, it's gonna go past the two minutes and it's gonna start alarming. But most of these timers will still continue to count. That kind of gives you an idea how, how poorly you're doing on that question. See, when I tell people to take a question database and don't be in a hurry to answer it because you're like, oh, the exam is two hour exam or three hour exam. I got to see how quickly I can answer this. Absolutely not, folks. I'm teaching you ways that are not intuitive the way other educators would teach you. That is not how you study for an exam. You wait until the last two weeks before your exam to start studying. Now, if your exam is tomorrow, then I would tell you you're done for the night. Okay, Joe, if you're testing tomorrow, I gave you some good practice tonight. Relax now. Let your mind relax. If you don't know it by now, all you're going to do is potentially get confused before tomorrow. 
relax, go have a cool beverage, watch a little TV, get to bed early so you're ready to go in the morning. And the first thing I want you to do when you get up in the morning is I want you to say to yourself, when you go in there to brush your teeth, do everything, I want you to look in that mirror and go, hey, you're amazing, I got this. Because you do got it. And I'm gonna tell you, confidence goes a long way when you're sitting for an exam, okay? There you go, Brandon. Must have been, must have been lagging or something, but thanks for, you, you, there you go. All right, all right, folks. Um, Schwartzy, Schwartzy says he likes it. I don't know if, how everybody feels, but this is what Swartzy says, and if the doc says it, it's gotta be true, okay? Swartzy says that he likes the new software, says it works very well. Well, there you go. I'm investing in y'all, so, um, and y'all have invested in me, and er I try to roll as much stuff into it, so y'all notice that little thing is not spinning anymore? That's because we invested and we bought it. So we have the whole rights to it, so, um, it's a great streaming software. Uh, they have some things that I recommend that they would do. I'd, I'd love for them to, there's some features that I would going to recommend that they add, and they may add them. But right now, I kind of love how it's working. I really do. All right, folks. I appreciate you all. I'm going to abruptly end the stream, but uh, I appreciate it. Hopefully you got something out of the night's lesson. Uh, until next time, folks, stay safe. God bless. Peace out.